Um, I'm going to talk about the state of the climate debate. Um, I've changed my talk a little bit relative to the abstract that's in the flyer, and I, think, I hope that you'll find it timely and informative. President Obama has made some very strong statements about climate change. We will respond to the threat of climate change, knowing that failure to do so would betray our children and future generations. No challenge, no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change. There's one issue that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent and growing threat of a changing climate. The basis for these strong statements has evolved from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Treaty, which in 1992 established a goal of stabilization of atmospheric greenhouse gases to prevent dangerous climate change. For the past 25 years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been conducting comprehensive assessments that have successively increased in confidence that Human-caused climate change is real. Human-caused climate change is dangerous. And action is needed to prevent dangerous human-caused climate change. In its current round of negotiations to be culminated at the December meeting in Paris, the UN Framework Convention is seeking to limit carbon dioxide emissions through voluntary intended nationally determined contributions, or INDCs. The key elements of the US INDC are to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025, and then economy-wide emission reductions of 80 percent by 2050. Now, President Obama can't accomplish all this on his own. He needs the cooperation of states. This figure from Climate Progress illustrates the commitment to acting on climate change from various states. You see the green states on the West Coast, New England, and also Minnesota. These are the states that are on board with President Obama's plans and are actively working to reduce the emissions. On the other hand, the red states are in conflict. Um, they are resisting and they are bringing, you know, and are playing this out in courts. My home state of uh, Georgia, okay, is clearly in what is categorized here is in the denier camp along with the state of Florida. Okay, now, now we can argue about how individual states should be categorized, but the key issue is that there isn't a lot of support at the state level for President Obama's plans. So President Obama clearly has his work cut out for him. He needs to build political support to actually implement his plan and realize emissions reductions. President Obama has tried several different arguments for building political and public support for his plan. The first argument that he's been using is related to the social cost of carbon. And the idea behind this is to assess the cost benefit of regulatory actions that impact carbon dioxide emissions. Well, there are challenges to this. First is that you don't really realize the benefits of these reductions until several hundred years into the future. And the costs and benefits estimated over 300 years are highly uncertain and contested. There's concern that high costs now will damage the economy and development. And there's also debate about the social discount rate. How much should we value potential damages to future people? The second argument that President Obama has been using relates to extreme weather. Particularly following Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, the US public was more concerned about climate change if it was making hurricanes worse or more frequent. President Obama stated, 
The best climate scientists in the world are telling us that extreme weather events, like hurricanes, are likely to become more powerful. Climate change didn't cause Hurricane Sandy, but it might have made it stronger. One of the chief scientists from the National Hurricane Center, Chris Lanzi, made the following statement in response. How is it that the White House links changes in hurricanes today to global warming when the World Meteorological Organization, NOAA, and the IPCC cannot? The third argument that President Obama has been using is the public health benefits of reducing carbon pollution. President Obama recently stated, carbon pollution causing climate change is contributing to health risks for many children. Over the past three decades, the percent of Americans with asthma has more than doubled, and climate change is putting those Americans at risk, greater risk of landing in the hospital. Well, the challenge is that carbon dioxide itself does not impact air quality and breathing. U.S. air quality in terms of ozone and particulates has improved substantially in the past decades. And President Obama was widely criticized when he brought his daughter Malia's asthma into the storyline about climate change. And, you know, the, the joke was that, well, maybe his cigarette smoking had more to do with that than <laughs> carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So, so that, it's, it's a hard case to make that cutting carbon dioxide emissions has public health benefits. The fourth argument that President Obama has been using is related to national security. President Obama recently stated, climate change constitutes a serious threat to global security, an immediate risk to our national security, and make no mistake, it will impact how our military defends our country. Well, the challenge is that the main security issue is the impact of extreme weather events, which is better addressed by adaptation. Carbon dioxide mitigation is an ineffective national security tool. And of course, President Obama has been widely criticized for focusing his foreign policy initiatives on climate change, all the while ISIS marches. One argument that President Obama hasn't tried to make explicitly is that it will reduce global warming. If you believe the climate models, the U.S. emissions reductions would reduce the warming by a fairly trivial amount that would get lost among the natural variability of climate. Okay, the reduction of 20% by 2025 will only prevent a few hundredths of a degree in warming by 2100. And reducing U.S. total emissions by 80% by 2050 will only prevent a little more than a tenth of a degree warming by 2100. Another difficulty facing President Obama is the treaty clause in the Constitution. The President shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. Well, last January, there was a sense of the Senate resolution, and the senators voted on two separate resolutions. The first one was climate change is real and not a hoax. Ninety-eight of the senators voted affirmative on that. The second statement is climate change is real, and human activity significantly contributes to climate change. Only 50 of the senators voted in support of that statement, which is significantly less than the two-thirds majority required to approve a treaty. So to what extent is President Obama's climate commitment enforceable? In the absence of state and congressional support, the plan is being enforced through the executive branch via the Environmental Protection Agency. There are ongoing legal challenges, and it seems that there are more emerge each week, but so far the Supreme Court has supported President Obama. 
Now, the next president may choose not to enforce all this or even to abolish the EPA. So President Obama has little more than a year remaining in his term as president. The Democratic Party candidates dominated by Hillary Clinton are expected to generally support President Obama's strategies regarding climate change. The Republican candidates for president are quite a different story. Several of them have recently made statements about climate change, and these excerpts illustrate the range of positions among the candidates on climate change. Jeb Bush stated, I don't think the science is clear of what percent is man-made and what percent is natural. It's convoluted. The climate is changing. We need to adapt to that reality. Ted Cruz. Specifically, satellite data demonstrate there have been no warming over the past 17 years. And I would note, whenever anyone makes that point, you immediately get vilified as a denier without anyone actually refuting the facts. Carly Fiorina. The only answer to this is innovation, and in that, America could be the best in the world. Okay, so is all this disagreement just politics? Or is there an underlying scientific disagreement? Well, everybody agrees on the basics. Surface temperatures have increased since 1880. No one's arguing about that. Humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. No debate over that. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. OK, everyone agrees on that. <coughs> However, the disagreement is about the most consequential issues. There's disagreement over whether the warming since 1950 has been dominated by human causes. Or is natural variability dominant? How much will the planet warm in the 21st century? Is warming dangerous? Can we afford to radically reduce carbon dioxide emissions? And will this reduction improve the climate and human well-being? OK, there's a lot of disagreement over these issues. At this point, there are three burning issues at the interface between climate science and policy. And that's going to be the focus of most of the rest of my talk. First one is the social cost of carbon, which relates to the economic costs of carbon dioxide and benefits of carbon dioxide reduction. The evolution of the 21st century climate, how much warming and when, and the impact of proposed carbon mitigation policies on 21st century climate change. With regards to the social costs of carbon, it is literally on trial right now in the state of Minnesota. A 1990s law requires a public utilities commission to establish externality values for carbon dioxide and other power plant pollutants to help guide utility planning decisions. The Public Utilities Commission adopted the Federal Social Cost of Carbon, or the SCC. And this is, and the Federal Social Cost of Carbon is being challenged by energy companies and industry groups in a current trial. Now there's a number of different assumptions that need to be made to conduct these assessments, but one of the most important ones is the so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity. So what is the equilibrium climate sensitivity? Well, it's the global surface temperature change following a doubling of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the equilibrium part means that you have to wait long enough for the climate system to equilibrate a few hundred years. Okay, how do we determine equilibrium climate sensitivity? Well, it can be determined from global climate models, from historical observations, and paleo climate reconstructions like tree rings. And using these different methods and different forcing data and whatever, you get a whole range of estimates of equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is reflected in this little um, distribution. OK, 
Okay, you see a range of values. Okay, so, so what values have people been working with for the equilibrium climate sensitivity? These are in degrees centigrade, and the values that are circled, three degrees is the canonical value, that if you double carbon dioxide over pre-industrial numbers, the climate will warm by three degrees centigrade or almost six degrees Fahrenheit if you allow the climate to equilibrate. And the US IWG is the US interagency working group. This is the one that put together the federal estimates of the social cost of carbon. And they bounded the distribution on the low end of 1.7 degrees and on the high end of 7.1. Okay. These values were ostensibly based on the IPCC fourth assessment report in 2007, which also found a mean value of three, but a lower bound of 1.5, and they felt that the uncertainty was too great. They couldn't even cite a plausible upper bound. Well, in the more recent fifth assessment report in 2013, they lowered the lower bound to one degree, and they were able to identify an upper bound of six degrees, but they were unable to identify a best estimate because there was too much disagreement between the climate models and the observational estimates. Okay, the climate models had an average value of 3.2 with a range between 2.1 and 4.7, the observations using the historical temperature record and information about solar forcing and volcanic eruptions, et cetera, came up with an average value that was half, 1.6, range of 1.1 to 4.1. And then most recently, within the last six months, a lot of the range is, is due to uncertainty in what we call aerosol forcing. This is small particles in the atmosphere, including pollution aerosol. And what this pollution aerosol does is it reflects the sunlight, and so it has a cooling effect. Well, the latest analysis indicates that this cooling effect is much smaller than we thought. So if you put this aerosol forcing lower aerosol forcing into the observational analysis, you see that you knock down this upper column by quite a bit. And the reason I have this column in red is because the costs of warming are dominated by the extreme tail values. Okay, and so you see that these values are all over the place. But the thing that really stands out is the value used in US policy is indefensibly high, okay? And this is at the heart of what this Minnesota trial is about, okay? I think it's very hard to defend such a high value. We'll see how it plays out. I've heard that um, the trial won't be decided until sometime this spring, and I've already heard that whichever side loses, they will appeal. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, it goes on and on. Okay, uh, climate sensitivity also enters into the calculations of determining how much warming the emissions reduction commitments will prevent in the 21st century. So the first set of commitments, the, the commitments to 2025 to 2030, made by all the countries, um, how much will they reduce the warming? And all these calculations are done with an equilibrium climate sensitivity of three, which may be too high. But again, the U.S. reduction of 28% will only prevent a few hundredths of a degree of warming. Now, estimates are just coming out in terms of globally, how much will the commitments reduce? Well, the two estimates that I've seen that have some credibility, um, 0.2 degrees centigrade from MIT, and then 0.17 degrees from Danish economist Bjorn Lomborg, 
I mean, this is very small. You go, well, why is it so small? Well, some of the countries are, will still be increasing out to 2030. And in particular, India's commitment allows it room to double or even triple its emissions between now and 2030. So is this an exercise in futility? Well, some people are making arguments that no, these commitments will reduce the warming. If you take all the warming you know, out to 2050 and the longer range commitments, here's one rendition of how much warming will be saved. So, am I, okay, so if you look at the blue curve, um, this is an exaggerated no action, you know, if we just keep burning like crazy. They argue 4.5 degrees centigrade. Well, we're not on a track to burn like crazy. We're already, you know, people are slowing down. They're making some commitments. And so then they argue, well, the, the path that we're currently on is the black path. And then the commitment from the... Um, countries will drop it down a little bit. And so this is arguing that you actually save, prevent a degree if everybody, you know, does all these emissions reductions. Well, it's conceivable that we can meet the targets, the 2030 targets. Nobody knows how we would, how the U.S., say, would reduce its emissions by 80%. It's not just the power plant emissions. Power plant emissions are only 30% of our CO2 emissions. There's transportation, there's agriculture, there's cement, there's a whole other host of things that we don't really know how to admit. Um, further, this 4.5 is extreme. The IPCC really um, has their highest trajectory to be four degrees. And then the UN Framework Convention is saying it would be down to 2.7 degrees. So there's a great deal of debate and arguments about how much it would actually save, but the target is two degrees by 2100. Okay, no matter how you slice it, we're nowhere near to meeting a target of two degrees by 2100 with these commitments. People can argue about the details, but we're not going to meet the two degree target. Okay, let's take a little bit closer look at the IPCC simulations. Okay, this is the official projections of the IPCC fifth um, assessment report for warming. This orange curve um, relates to the extreme trajectory. You note know, the average is only 4 degrees, not 4.5 degrees. And the purple scenario is one where we, the emissions peaked in 2015 and then started to drastically lower after that. And you see that even though the emissions peak around um, 2015, the temperature still increases out to about 2050 because there's a lot of heat stored in the oceans and it slowly you know, comes out and it takes a while to equilibrate. So this is why the emissions reductions don't influence the climate very quickly. There's already a lot of thermal inertia in the system that is going to keep the warming for a while. But the IPCC view is that the 21st century climate change depends on how much carbon dioxide we emit. Okay, and that it's in our control. Now, how well are the climate models doing? Well, this figure, that the squiggly bluish line, is the global temperature observations for the last maybe 25 years, and the gray swath is an envelope of the climate model simulations. Okay, and you see that the observations are running right at the bottom of the envelope of the climate model simulations. And in fact, the IPCC, even because of this, they downgraded 
their projection for the next 20 years as indicated by this red hatched area to reflect that you know, it's just not warming up as fast as the climate model said. So there's a growing divergence between climate models and observations. This raises some serious questions. Are climate models too sensitive to greenhouse forcing? Is model natural climate variability inadequate? Are climate model projections of 21st century warming too high? Well, there's another perspective on how the 21st century climate will play out. And this is a view that emphasizes natural variability. This perspective states that the warming will continue to be slow for at least another decade, maybe into the 2030s, because of the ocean circulation patterns. We're currently in the cool phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And sometime in the 2020s, we'll probably enter the cool phase of the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation. Climate models are too sensitive to human forcing. 21st century warming will be on the low end of the IPCC projections or even below. The IPCC projections take no account of possible variations in the sun or volcanoes. I mean, we can't predict these. I mean, this is a wild card. Um, some scientists, notably um, groups in Russia and Germany, are predicting major solar cooling um, in the coming decades. And finally, we can't rule out unforeseen surprises. So in terms of the scenarios of future climate, the IPCC is focused only on carbon dioxide emissions, but there are other things you know, that have been going on <laughs> for, for millennia and you know, millions of years, volcanic eruptions, solar effects, long-range ocean oscillations, geologic processes, and maybe even some unknowns. So in my opinion, scenarios of the 21st century climate that only depend on CO2 emissions are oversimplistic and will leave us open for surprises, I would suspect. Now, a majority of climate scientists seem to support the IPCC perspective, with recent surveys of scientists suggesting between 52% and 85% of climate scientists agree with the IPCC in terms of what's causing the recent warming and how the 21st century climate change will play out. Okay, so why do scientists disagree? What about those other 15 to 48 percent who are disagreeing with the IPCC? Why do they disagree? Well, there's insufficient and inadequate observational evidence. There's disagreement about the value of different classes of evidence in particular, the global climate models. There's disagreement about the appropriate logical framework for linking and assessing the evidence. Differing assessments of areas of ambiguity and ignorance. And finally, belief polarization as a result of politicization of the science is contributing greatly to the disagreement. Now, none of the most consequential scientific uncertainties are going to be resolved anytime soon. There's a great deal of work still to do to understand climate change. So a lot of the discussion has turned to, will global warming be dangerous in the 21st century? Well, what does dangerous mean? It's been in the UN Framework Convention 1992 tra Treaty, preventing dangerous human interference with climate change, but it's never really been clear what does dangerous really mean. Well, it was only a little more than two years ago when they finally decided on a criterion for dangerous. So the UN Framework Convention has defined dangerous as two degrees centigrade post-industrial warming and we've already warmed by eight-tenths of a degree centigrade. 
Now, when we will reach 2 degrees centigrade depends not only on the equilibrium climate sensitivity, like how sensitive the climate is to carbon dioxide, but also on what the natural climate variability is doing. Now, a lot of the, the dangers are really tied to extreme weather events. The hurricanes, our heat waves getting worse, our floods or droughts getting worse. Well, let's take a look at some of the data for the U.S. This figure from the EPA plots the heat wave index related to the extent of heat waves over the continental U.S. You see an overwhelming spike in the 1930s, and the most recent years don't stand out at all. So the, the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s stands out starkly in terms of record heat waves and droughts, which were far more extreme than anything in recent decades than can be attributed to human-caused climate change. Drought. This figure shows the U.S. drought index from NOAA. And, and again, it's for the one index for the contiguous U.S. If a given year has a green bar, that means it was relatively wet. If it has a goldish brown bar, it means it was relatively dry. Well, you, you see that we, we currently have a little bit of a, a dry spell, largely dominated by what's going on um, in the western U.S., although Florida's had its own drought as well. But again, this is nothing compared to what you saw in the 1930s or even the 1950s. So there's nothing unusual going on with drought in the U.S. Let's take a look at hurricanes. Believe me, I remember the horrendous years of 2004 and 2005. I mean, that was amazing, and I can only imagine what it was like um, to be down here. But if you look at the record of U.S. landfalling hurricanes, again, apart from these two horrendous years in 2004 and 2005, there hasn't been much going on. And actually an overall declining trend. And it's been 10 years, actually, since 2005, since there's been a major hurricane strike the U.S. Well, if you look at the global hurricane data, I mean, what's going on globally? The landfalls is, in the Atlantic is just a small fraction of the overall global hurricanes. Well, global hurricane activity is indicated in this upper graph by the metric called ACE, Accumulated Cyclone Index. It's a metric that includes number, duration, and intensity. And what you see is a lot of oscillation and variability, and you don't, certainly don't see anything notable going on in recent years, although 2015 looks like it will be up here, you know, up near the, up high, largely because of extreme activity in the Pacific. Okay, so, you know, I was a co-author on a paper in 2005 that showed that the percent of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes had been increasing since 1970. Okay, and that was published a few weeks after Hurricane Katrina and cre created quite a stir. Well, it does seem that there is some signal in this percent of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes. It is increasing, but whether the increase is caused by um, natural variability, or human-caused global warming, you know, it's impossible to disentangle that signal. But the punchline is this. Any impact of human-caused global warming on hurricanes is lost in the noise of natural climate variability. Global sea level rise. Is this a coastal threat? Well, global sea level has been rising for thousands of years. In recent decades, sea level rise has been three millimeters per year, or three centimeters per decade, about an inch and a half. How much of the recent sea level rise is caused by humans versus how much is natural variability is hotly disputed. 
Now the impacts of sea level rise are local, and you need to put sea level rise from warming in context with other factors, such as geologic sinking or rising, groundwater withdrawal, and river engineering. The arrows on this diagram relate, this is from NOAA, relate to the magnitude of observed sea level rise over the last 50 years or so. The green arrows are zero to three millimeters per year. Recall the recent average is three millimeters per year. And Florida um, estimates for, in most regions of Florida is actually less than two millimeters per year um, rise. Now, if you look at the regions where the, the rise is really high, notably um, New Orleans, okay, the observed rate of sea level rise is substantially greater than anything that can be explained by warming. Again, we have geologic sinking, groundwater withdrawal, and the way the Mississippi has been engineered all contribute to the large sea level rise in New Orleans. So, Again, a little of this can maybe be blamed on humans, but you know, over the 20th century, there was about a foot of sea level rise. And whether the rate of sea level rise recently is accelerating, um, again, sea level rise around the, the 1940s was about as high as it is now. So it's hard to deduce that there is any global acceleration of sea level rise. But again, that's hotly disputed. Now, in terms of extreme events, the decision makers say, yeah, 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 we've heard, actually this comes from a project that I did for the Office of Secretary of Defense about four years ago. Yeah, 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 we've read the IPCC reports. Now tell us what you don't know. Okay, they don't like to be surprised. Okay, but they will be surprised. And they're interested in the so-called black swan events. You know, these are these like extreme events, like arguably the 2004, 2005 hurricane season would have been a black swan event. You know, they're unanticipated catastrophic events, but in hindsight, you know, you should have been able to maybe foresee them, okay? The other one, potentially more, but, but they're events you recover from. Um, the other one is the Dragon King, and this is a major bifurcation. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna need some water. A Dragon <coughs> King is a tipping point where things really go to somewhere else and stay there. <coughs> Examples are abrupt climate change, probably the most serious tipping boy point that could plausibly happen over the next several hundred years would be the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Even if this were to collapse, it would take some maybe 400 years to actually melt, but that would be associated with you know, 18 feet of sea level rise. I mean, that's maybe the worst thing that might happen. So trying to understand, you know, what are these extreme events are probably more important than understanding what the average temperature is going to do. And not a lot of effort has been going, gone into understanding all this, in my opinion. So how should we respond to the threat of climate change given these uncertainties? First, there's increasing evidence that the threat from global warming is overstated. However, maybe the IPCC is right. And if the threat is not overstated, there are major shortfalls in current and proposed solutions. Well, why are we, you know, after dealing with this problem for almost 30 years, why are we in this situation where we don't know how bad the problem is and the solution that we've come up with is inadequate for dealing with the problem if it really is bad? Well, part of the problem comes from viewing climate change as a tame problem. 
where we have clearly understand stand the problem and we've identified the appropriate solutions. It's just a matter of taking the arrows out of your quiver and boom, hitting the target. Okay. Um, President Obama views it this way. He says, we don't have time for a meeting of the flat earth society. You know, let's just get on with it. Well, I view the climate change problem very differently as a wicked mess. A wicked problem is complex with dimensions that are difficult to define and changing with time. A mess is characterized by the complexity of interrelated issues with suboptimal solutions that create additional problems. My overarching concern is that the climate change problem and its solution have been vastly oversimplified. This leads us to ask the question, and it's largely about values. What climate do we want? Do we want to return to the pre-industrial era, um, the 1700s? Remember George Washington and Valley Forge? It was pretty cold back then, <laughs> okay? Or would we prefer the climate of the 1930s or the 1970s? Or would a warmer climate be more desirable? The answer to this question may vary by region. Canada, Siberia, and northern China might prefer a warmer climate. My point is there's no simple answer to this question. Any change, be it natural or human cause, can be disrupted. Now, one of the reasons that the climate change problem is a wicked mess relates to a massive conflict of values. Sustainability is the value that is driving the UN climate policies that are trying to mitigate damage by reducing CO2 emissions. Now these policies are in stark conflict with survivability issues in the developing world. Think Africa, where there are severe challenges to meeting basic needs and where their idea of clean green energy is anything other than burning dung inside their dwelling for cooking and heating. Okay. So there's a massive conflict playing out in the UN negotiations okay, between people who are trying to reduce emissions versus countries who don't have access to grid electricity. And in Africa, the cheapest and quickest way to get grid electricity is coal. They have lots of coal. It's a big conflict. The other conflict is um, related to resilience. While the UN policies also include adaptation aimed at improving resilience and reducing vulnerability to extreme weather events, um, the funds for adaptation and to support resilience are in direct competition with funds for mitigation. So there's supposed to be a hundred billion dollars a year of fund where the developed countries are supposed to contribute into a fund where the developing countries then use this for infrastructure projects and things like that. Um, but so far only 10 billion has been committed, okay? And this is, the, res the countries in the resilience column are, think South Asia, where they are faced with horrendous extreme weather from floods, droughts, heat waves, uh, tropical cyclones. I mean, it, it's just overwhelming in that region. And th they want help here and now for dealing with those issues rather than hoping for some relief in 2100. So again, there's a big conflict, you know, with these countries saying, well, unless you support this loss and damage fund, then we're not going to play ball with reducing the CO2 emissions, okay? And finally, we have thriveability, which is about people wanting not only to make money and support economic development, but also to strive for greatness and transform the infrastructure for society. And the goals of thriveability are also in conflict with sustainability. Okay, and 
because thrivability is more about economic development. So all four of these values are legitimate values, okay? But in terms of how they play out, in terms of you know, policy and how you spend money and what the priorities are, again, there's a massive conflict. And all of these values conflicts are playing out in the debates and the disagreements with the UN Framework Convention. So, what I'm trying to promote is a way of, we want to broaden the framework for thinking about how we approach this problem. And so, thinking about problems in new ways and trying to accommodate different values, more than one value column, can lead to solutions that have greater political viability. For example, at the intersection of sustainability and resilience, you can identify robust strategies that have multiple benefits with little downside. Okay, this would include water resource management, infrastructure security, improving agricultural productivity, ecological conservation and restoration, resource conservation and re reuse, and energy research. You know, all of these have little downside, have benefits even if um, carbon dioxide caused global warming turns out not to be a big problem. Another example is um, looking at the intersection of survivability and thrivability. The challenges of climate change related to survivability can benefit from thrivability thinking. Particularly some strategies suggested by the concept of anti-fragility, whereby you learn and grow from adversity. Anti-fragility is about not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward from adversity. Okay, and some of these strategies include economic development, reducing the downside from volatility, developing a range of options, tinkering with small experiments, and developing and testing transformative ideas. Now, in summary, I hope I've provoked you into thinking about the climate problem as a very complex one that can be characterized as a wicked mess. My main take home message for you is that we have oversimplified both the problem and its solutions. Now, I think I've provided you with a common sense perspective on this whole thing. But I will warn you, my views on all this are not popular among many of my academic colleagues in the climate community. So, okay. <laughs> although they are gaining some traction in the broader academic community. This cartoon was drawn for me by a French cartoonist following a Scientific American article on me. This was like a six-page article with a full-page picture. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. The title on the art article, Climate Heretic Judith Curry Turns on Her Colleagues. <laughs> okay, okay, but, but a French cartoonist um, drew this for me, and if you don't read French, the caption says, sorry boss, she won't burn. <laughs> so I'm continuing my odyssey to wrap my head around the climate change problem in my own way. Um, I'm seeking to open up the dialogue on climate science and solutions to the perceived threat of climate change. Um, I'm very active in social media. Um, I have a blog, Climate Etc. at JudithCurry.com, and I tweet at CurryJA. Um, my blog, Climate Etc., provides a forum for technical experts and the interested public to engage in a discussion on topics related to climate science, its impacts, and policy options. So I look forward to joining the dialogue with you this evening and hopefully in the future. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker.
as politicians say, I am not a scientist. So I don't really know anything about this. I do some reading, and I'm wondering, I noticed that you didn't mention methane. I've heard different figures about how much worse methane is than carbon dioxide. Okay. And, uh, well, yeah. so I was wondering, because the Siberian permafrost is melting, and, and I also wonder about the oceans slowly warming and the clathrates at the bottom of the ocean uh, releasing methane. Methane from many sources being added to the atmosphere, and were you considering this if, uh, um, when you were talking about carbon dioxide? Um, it's yes, it, it's considered molecule per molecule. Methane packs more punch as a greenhouse gas does, than does carbon dioxide. However, the concentration is very much smaller the amounts in the atmosphere are smaller than carbon dioxide. So overall, it packs a smaller punch. But the key question is, are there some sources of methane that could emerge in the atmosphere? Um, the issue of massive inputs from thawing permafrost, that possibility is out there. But the assessment of the IPCC, if I remember exactly, was very unlikely to be anything significant on the time scale of the 21st century. So it's not expected to be a significant problem on the time scale of the 21st century. But it's out there as one of those things that we don't adequately understand. This may not be in your arena of expertise, but what about the potential of harvesting CO2? Harvesting it. Oh, okay. Um, some sort of sequestration of taking it, removing it from the atmosphere. There are a number of options that are being tried and are being talked about. Um, large-scale CO2 sequestration from the power plants um, has been tried. It's extremely expensive, and it doesn't seem to scale up. There, you know, the potential for new technologies, imaginative technologies, I think is wide open, but there's nothing out there right now that is approaching the combination of feasibility and cost effectiveness where you know people could but you know on a time scale of three decades or something my guess is that people would come up with something you know if it's important enough people will figure something out but we're certainly not close to being there yet Uh, recent data has shown that in the last two years the polar ice caps have actually increased in area as opposed to decreased. Is that true? And if so, what's going on? Okay. Lots of discussion on that in recent months. Um, Antarctica, the eastern part of Antarctica, does seem to be growing. The western part of Antarctica does seem to be shrinking. Overall, Antarctica, the whole Southern Ocean, Antarctic region is cold. And in fact, this year might be the record cold for the whole Antarctic region. So again, this is something not expected or predicted by climate models. On the, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, the Arctic sea ice had decreased. It's creeping back up. Um, but again, there's a lot of natural oscillations. It's hard to discern what's going on. Again, Greenland had been melting. Now this was like this year most was not a big melt year at all, and it looks like the northern part of Greenland is growing, um, especially in the Arctic. It's very sensitive to these multi-decadal oscillations in ocean heat transport. So where we're at, you know, so how to sort out the global warming signal, from the natural oscillation is tough in the Arctic. In the Antarctic, trying to explain 
why it's so cold, <laughs> okay, is, an, is not very easy, you know, without invoking some sort of multi-century scale um, ocean oscillation. So a um, lot of challenges to understanding and interpreting what's going on in the polar region. There seems to be a bipolar seesaw, you know, hot in the Arctic, cold in the Antarctic, and vice versa. So, and that seems to be natural variability, not a signal of uh, human-caused global warming. A lot of things we don't understand there. Um, I've seen uh, personally, and I've seen in, on TV, a lot about glaciation and how glaciers are receding worldwide. Uh, and this seems to be a fairly constant thing. I mean, uh, the, the Mont Blanc Glacier in France, for example, has gone back so far now that you, it's, it's just not like it used to be back in the, in the 50s. Could you address that? Okay, well, land glaciers show a fair amount of variability. Okay, and some regions are growing and some regions are sinking. I'd say if you had to add them all up, there's probably more shrinking than growing. But it's not just temperature. It's rainfall. It's pollution, dark pollution. So there's, you know, different effects. So if a glacier is shrinking, you can't just blame it on warming. So, again, it's one of those things that has several causes that you need to untangle for each individual glacier. But they don't seem to grow. Oh, oh, some of them are. In some regions, they are. In some regions, they are. Yeah, so... Okay, again, let's thank our speaker. No simple signal. Thank you. Dr. Curry, thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. So uh, my first question for you is, according to your Wikipedia page, you are part of what's called the scientific opinion, or more commonly, the 97% consensus on climate change. Yet I've read in several pages that you're referred to as a, a climate skeptic or even a climate denier. And when I Google your name, one of the first things that comes up is an article in the Scientific American uh, entitled, Climate Heretic, Judith Curry Turns on Her Colleagues. So. Uh, why is it that people are calling you a climate skeptic um, or even a denier? Well, climate science has become highly politicized and the strategy used um, by the climate community to influence public policy is speaking consensus to power. So over the past several decades, they've worked to build this consensus. And following the 2009 Climate Gate episode, I started challenging the consensus, saying, wait a minute, uh, we haven't been sufficiently transparent. We haven't adequately characterized the uncertainties. We shouldn't be dismissing skeptics. I mean, we have to do a better job. And I started saying things like that that I thought were completely reasonable, but I was immediately thrown out of the tribe, <laughs> if you will, mm. um, and labeled as a heretic, denier, whatever else. So it, it, it's just a reflection of how politicized the science has become and how silly this debate really is at this point. Well, speaking of debates, you hear public figures say all, all the time that the debate is over and, um, and we need to move forward. What do, you, what do you think about those comments? And well, physicists are still debating quantum mechanics and gravity, okay? Um, things that we think are relatively settled. Uh, science is never settled. And something as complex as the climate system and in a relatively new field, um, climate change, there's no way the science is settled. There's a whole lot more that we don't know than we do know. You talked about the politicization of, of the field. What do you see as the greatest danger of this mixing of politics with science? Well, two things. You end up with science as going off on the wrong track. I don't know if you've heard the joke about the drunk looking for his keys under the streetlight. And somebody asks, well, why are you only looking there? Well, it's the only place I can see. The same thing has been happening in climate science. We've only been shining a light on one little piece of the problem. 
the part about increasing CO2 from human activities. We haven't been paying sufficient attention to natural climate variability. And as a result, we're doing a great disservice to understanding the climate system. And as we fail to adequately understand the climate system, we have tremendous opportunity to mislead decision makers. Well, one thing I thought was interesting about another interview that I heard with you was you, you were talking about how even if all the uh, measures for carbon reduction were adopted and then perfectly implemented, we might not see an effect from that. Uh, those measures would be maybe 50 years out. Well, it's really much worse than that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the commitments that people have made for the, I, um, the UN in terms of their uh, emissions reductions out to 2030, well, if you say, well, how much, assuming that they keep those commitments steady through the end of the 21st century, the amount of warming that would be prevented is about two-tenths of a degree centigrade. Most of the um, benefits would uh, be realized for um, a longer time, and, and we're really talking about a minuscule amount of warming that will be saved. And because of the lags in the climate system owing to ocean heat storage, any emissions reductions that we do now, it's still going to keep warming because of the thermal inertia in the oceans. So, um, you know, the accounting is just being done, you know, as economists are reacting to and trying to interpret all these commitments and what it actually means. But the studies that I've seen suggest that we're only accomplishing a, a few, you know, a few tenths of a degree centigrade decrease in the rate of warming. And this assumes that you actually believe the climate models. I mean, I think the climate models are running too hot. And if the climate models are in fact running too hot, even less warming would be saved. So these, these numbers, these figures of, of projected um, curbing of warming due to essentially regulating greenhouse gases, these numbers are... are well, they, they use climate models to climate see models. how the climate will respond to the reductions in carbon dioxide associated with reduced emissions. Hmm. Well, you know, just this year, um, there was a report released sounding the alarm bells about new data with regard to sea level rise. And this report said that sea level rise may occur 10 times faster than originally thought, um, and that in 45 years we could have 10 feet of sea level rise. Uh, several weeks ago I was giving a public lecture and I was talking about sea level rise and one of, one of the audience members raised his hand and said, wow, I didn't realize that sea level rise, you know, was rising before humans started emitting fossil fuels. This whole issue of sea level rise is so tied to human activities that most people don't realize that sea level has been rising for a, the last 10,000 years since we came, since we've been coming out of the last ice age. Um, the question is whether sea level rise is accelerating owing to human-caused emissions. Um, and you say, well, obviously yes. Well, it's not obvious at all because. Even the most recent IPCC report published in 2013 presented a figure that showed that the rate of sea level rise around 1940, 1950 was just as high as it is in, in the last few decades. So it, it doesn't look like there's any great acceleration so far um, of sea level rise associated with human-caused warming. These predictions of alarming sea level rise um, depend on massive um, melting of the big continental glaciers, Greenland and Antarctica. Um, the Antarctic ice sheet is actually growing. Greenland shows large multi-decadal variability in when it's growing and shrinking. So sorting out natural versus human caused variability and what's going on with these ice sheets, um, you know, is very difficult to do. But in any event, there's no evidence so far that 
humans are increasing sea level rise in any kind of a worrying way. If it's true that curbing carbon dioxide in the here and now is, is going to have very minimal effects in the here and now, um, what kind of solutions are you proposing, or do you have any solutions you're proposing? Well, I'm, I'm a climate scientist. I'm not in the business of proposing solutions. So, I mean, I can tell you which ones make more or less sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, the technologies that we currently have, I mean, if we're trying to pull this off using wind and solar, it's not going to work. We need new energy technologies and additional research and development on new energy technologies makes more sense than trying to implement wind and solar that aren't up to the task. But I think the bigger issue is, I mean, the, the real danger with climate change and variability, whatever the cause, is extreme weather events. You know, the heat waves, the floods, the droughts, the hurricanes, and trying to reduce vulnerability to these extreme weather and climate events um, can help people in the here and now. Um, whether climate change is due to natural variability or due to humans. It can help us reduce our vulnerability to these extreme events that have always happened and will continue to happen. Right. So you're saying that we know that we're going to have more extreme weather events and we should be putting our resources into preparing more Well, for I'm those. not telling, I never tell anybody what they should do um, because it's a very complex problem. And and there are a lot of other problems out there. So why should we spend all our resources on this problem? So it's a complex issue, and I avoid telling anybody, oh, we should do this or we should do that. All I do is look at policy options and try to point out their unintended consequences and whether they'll have the you know, intended effect. When you began sort of saying the things you were talking about, about more transparency in science and and climate science and, and writing about it. And you are already the chair of a department at a, a major technical school in the United States. You'd already been published uh, at least 100 times. Um, do you think that a, a younger Dr. Judith Curry in the kind of climate, uh, no pun intended, but in the political climate we have now would have had a harder time doing what you've done? Um, a number of scientists have lost their jobs over speaking out against the consensus. Um, I'm a tenured faculty member. I'm pretty senior. Um, you know, so I could afford to do it. A lot of younger people who aren't tenured can't afford to do it. I hear from scientists all the time who say they wish they could speak out, etc. Huh. But they, they don't want to... <laughs> They don't want to go through the kind of baloney that I've had to go through, and I can't blame them. And what what baloney is that exactly? Well, Google my name, and you'll see it. Yeah. Google okay. Judith Curry, and you'll see what I have to put up with. Okay. That's about all the time we have for today, but I'd like to thank you very much for letting us into your office and having this interview. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.